Thanks for being here. Thank you. Thank I was you. just checking to see if Tim Sloan was still in the audience for when we talk Venmo, because I'm yeah, sure uh, exactly. Dan has yeah. plenty to say on that front. I do. I do. <laughs> Tim Jr. You know, it was amazing because I've been sitting over here in the media corner and I've seen, you know, a lot of our speakers come through today. And I saw you and Ryan from Visa. I saw Tim come in, and everyone is friends. Isn't that nice? It, it, Everyone payments, is friends. Payments is a small community. And you can joke with each other, but it wasn't like that a few years ago. No. It went from enemies to frenemies to looks like friends now. And it's been this amazing proliferation of partnerships where everyone is benefiting. How, you've been a big part, PayPal has been an enormous part of that. How did that come to be? What was some of the decisions you made to decide to partner with banks and the credit card companies to work together? And, you know, do you still, do you think that was the right decision? Yeah. Um, so first of all, uh, thanks for inviting uh, us to, uh, to be a part of this. Um, it's nice to see everybody. Um, I think, um, the reason we were always partners um, with the financial institutions around the world is that um, we drove a lot of volume um, through uh, our digital processing and the scale that we had. But the reason we were uh, also seen as um, against the financial institutions is that traditionally PayPal would steer customers to low cost instruments to help our business model, which you know was traditionally uh, balance or uh, ACH, um, that was good for our business model, but it really confused our customers um, because they wanted to uh, off times pay with their credit card. They wanted to basically use their digital wallet like they use their regular wallet. You just decide what they want to pay with every single time they make a transaction. And so the most monumental decision that we made at PayPal was offering a thing, what we call customer choice, which was basically for every single transaction, basically present to the consumer, here are all the different ways you can pay for that, you choose. Once we did choice and stopped steering customers, which I don't think um, anyone ever thought we would do, it really opened up um, the potential for us to partner across the entire ecosystem, and that's what happened. And um, I, I think you see the affection that we all have for each other um, because we've become great partners. It really is kind of how do we become allies in the war on cash mm -hmm. instead of battling each other um, needlessly so. And I do think, Deirdre, one thing that is a really interesting concept that I think um, as you think about the era ahead of us, the digital era in front of us, I think no one company can actually serve consumers the entirety of the value proposition alone. I think what we need to figure out is how do we take our platforms, and we're all becoming platform companies, and how do we kind of take the best of the assets of one company and the best of the assets of another company, put them together to hyper-serve consumers that neither of us could do alone? It's complicated because there are control issues and financial issues. But if you can do that well, uh, all companies and all consumers can come out ahead. Right now, Brad, talking to you, I sort of, Dan, I consider PayPal the old guard of FinTech. Wait a minute. <laughs> They're the middle guard. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. I guess, I guess of the digital <laughs> age, right? And I realize we have some very old banks in the room. Um, so it's funny to put it that way. But I do think of you guys as sort of the old guard. And Brad, you're very much the new the newcomers um, to the world of payments, and certainly crypto has been on a roller coaster. When you hear but Brad Dan, is the best dressed in the entire room right now, so <laughs> I just want to point that out. I like I like, the, the, I like by the way you're in San Francisco and you've kept it formal. Well, when you're the small company and you're on stage with the big company, he can wear cowboy boots. I'm going to wear, you know, I, I, I'm, we're, we're selling to banks. We're uh, trying to impress the banks. But I thought, you know, the banks are supposed to be, you know, attracting you guys, right? Well, it's funny, actually, it is a small digression, but sometimes we have meetings with senior people at banks, and they'll be meeting, coming to our office, and so they'll dress down. They're coming to our office, so we dress right. up, and we just miss each other. And uh, <laughs> So are they the ones wearing Patagonia vests yeah, they and all their sneakers, exactly. and you're the one in suits? <laughs> exactly, yes. <laughs> um, okay, but talk to me about a little bit about the evolution. You're sort of at the beginning, it feels like, of this journey in terms of cryptocurrencies and the roller coaster that they've been on over the last few years. 
where do you expect them to be a few years from now? And if I asked you this about PayPal and you know PayPal's and yeah. Squares of the world a few years ago, it would have been a very different picture. Are you are you surprised by where you are? But first, let me ask you, Brad. Yeah. Where do you think you're going to be? How does this all evolve? Look, I, I think that what we've heard on stage today, I agree with a lot of. I disagree with some of. You know, we have uh, payment networks that are not interoperable. Uh, you know, I jokingly, but it's actually serious, point out that if anybody here decided, hey, I want to take you know ten thousand dollars from my account at Wells Fargo and move it to Bar Barclays and have it in pounds sterling. The fastest way to do that is to get on an airplane at SFO and fly it there. <laughs> That's a crazy statement. Sure. I mean, another manifestation that I know that, you know, I, I am a PayPal customer, I'm a Venmo customer, the lack of interoperability is manifested even within that, that network. And so when Ripple thinks about the future, we're thinking about how do we create interoperable networks in the same way that the birth of the internet of information created interoperable networks of information, and now any of us can access any piece of information from anywhere in the world, yet we can't move our own value from point A to point B. You know, uh, there's lots and lots of examples I can give on that. So when Ripple thinks about the world, it is how do we stitch this together with the same kinds of technologies that are protocols like TCP IP, the underpinnings of the internet, SMTP, the underpinnings of email, such that we actually can uh, have interoperable networks. I, I, I think it is inevitable that we will get there. Uh, I believe that blockchain technologies can have a fundamental impact on achieving that. I agree, Tim Sloan is up here talking about how, you know, hey, I thought this was gonna take over the world. I mean, look, the, the, the internet- He's not the only one. That seems to be sort of the buzz amazingly here is that, you know, there's not a huge amount of use cases yet. So what is, what is look, the tipping point? The payments use case is very real and it is alive and it is working. Uh, and we have announced, we've signed over 200 financial institutions around the world and there are billions of dollars that we are moving through Ripple's technology. So, I mean, on the global scale of cross-border payments, which is measured in trillion, it's still early. But, you know, look, even the markets are, the crazy crypto markets, it's still early. And so I, I'm not surprised by the volatility. I think you're starting to see some of that wash out with the supposed crypto winter. Uh, I think that's healthy for any market. When you get ahead of itself, and there's a lot of hype and a lot of, frankly, BS use cases. But the payments use case is very real, and it's, uh, certainly we're having a lot of traction in the market. How does your business fit in when it is interesting you say that because you look at you know J.P. Morgan, where you had Diamond saying that he thinks Bitcoin is a fraud, a fraud, and, and, and then he launched a coin. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and it sort of reminds me a little bit of PayPal's journey too, the sort of contentious relationship with banks and the uh, credit card rails. Um, so are you seeing the shift happen? And again, like where is this five years from now? Are you able to exist in a world where um, JP, the JPM coin exists and other banks have their own forms of um, cryptocurrencies? Look, the, the JPM coin, I think, actually, in many ways, has been great for the industry because, you know, someone who not that long ago is saying Bitcoin's a fraud is now leaning in, and it was a macro good thing for the industry and bringing credibility, I'll give it a thumbs up. The, the JPM coin, though, if you really think about it, and there's a lot of banks represented in this room, you know, is Wells Fargo going to use the JPM coin? Probably not. Is B of A going to use the JPM coin? Probably not. And so are we all going to have a Wells Fargo coin and a B of A coin, and now what about the interoperability between these coins? The other thing that makes no sense to me, in order to get a JPM coin, you deposit a dollar in a JPM account, so it's one-to-one -one backed in dollars, and you can only use it intra-JPM's ledger. Why didn't I just use a dollar? <laughs> I actually don't understand what problem that was solving. I think you're illustrating why there's been a lot of skepticism in crypto and the blockchain, and blockchain right here. And it's not that people don't believe in it and that it has a very useful case, it's just that it hasn't picked up in a significant way when, you know, Tim said, thought it might have changed the world by now. And yeah. Dan, are you surprised by that? Speaking of PayPal, you guys used to actually process Bitcoin transactions, and now you don't. Yeah. Um, I was waiting for you to say more, Brad. Because um, <laughs> literally every time I listen to uh, Brad or Chris Larson before that, I learn a little bit more. Um, because I do think a lot of uh, blockchain and, uh, and crypto is, it's, it's more complex and complicated than like most people do at, at its surface level. Um, I, do, um, I do think that what was unfortunate um, with blockchain um, is that everybody immediately associated with crypto. And I think um, actually, and I, 
you know, never met the uh, inventors of this, although someday I hope that I get the chance to, um, uh, that I think what they created through crypto was a incentive mechanism to embed blockchain as a protocol. Um, and it was only the first application was this crypto. And, and I think because there was a limited amount, it would grow in value and it was a great incentive structure for people to want to embed blockchain as a replacement protocol because protocols in and of themselves aren't that sexy. Most people wouldn't like spend their time trying to implement a protocol, um, but if there's a reward mechanism for it, um, that works actually quite beautifully. So I think that the reason we started to accept it and then didn't accept uh, crypto, um, although we are now working with Coinbase and others to allow for uh, the transfer of, of crypto into fiat, uh, currency um, is because it was so volatile that many merchants who operate on a on a quite a tight margin couldn't withstand the swings of the volatility and therefore had to immediately <clears throat> take the crypto and um, translate it into fiat currency and pay a fee for that and so the efficiency um, that was promised with uh, with crypto and blockchain was obviated by the volatility. Um, and so uh, as that volatility um, starts to even out and you're seeing things like stable coins or digital currencies pegged to a fiat currency to try and uh, stabilize that, which is what I think some of these uh, banks are, are trying to do is take the volatility out and therefore allow for uh, more payments uh, type of transactions through blockchain. Brad, do you think, though, it's important for companies like PayPal to be experimenting with Bitcoin? You look at Square, which reintroduced it back into its system, yeah. and it's not making up a huge amount of volume, but they're gaining experience, and they're letting their customers play around with it well, I'm gonna, at the I'm very least. I'm going to answer that out of both sides of my mouth. I mean, on one hand, you know, uh, <laughs> I thought it was interesting, again, having watched some of the earlier panels, you know, uh, Tim Sloan from Wells Fargo is saying, hey, we did this experiment. We did one transaction. You know, I, I'm kind of like, well, that, you know, the hype is ahead of the reality in lots of parts of blockchain, but there are real use cases and real things happening. I feel like doing one transaction, you're kind of like, wait a minute, that was just, you know, that was a, an academic science experiment. On the other hand, you know, I, I look at what's happening, and despite the fact that I agree with the idea that the hype has been ahead of the reality broadly, that's largely because I think these technologies have been in search of a use case. Like, one of the problems with Silicon Valley is you have, Technologies in search of a problem versus here's a problem, let's bring the right technology to it. I think the reason why Ripple has enjoyed a lot of traction, a lot of success, is we focused very clearly on a real problem around cross-border transactions. It's a massive industry. It is, you know, I, I was on stage with somebody from the World Bank and they're talking about the average remittance cost today is 600 basis points. And then by the year 2030, they want it to be 300 basis mm -hmm. points. I happened to be on stage right after him, and I said, look, if, if we only get to yeah. 300 basis points by the year 2030, we have failed massively. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, one shared passion that I think uh, we have with Dan is, I do think if these technologies are successful, you're reducing friction, and you're bringing people either that are underbanked or unbanked into the financial community in a way that they can't be served today profitably. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm glad you bring up the example of cross-border transactions. I have a lot of experience with this. I'm Canadian, so I'm constantly moving money around. I've lived in you know, other parts of the world. Why can't I today be able to do that immediately? I, you know, I'm, full disclosure, I use a company called TransferWise, another great fintech company, because they have the lowest rate, even more so than any bank that I could go to. But why can't we do that right it's now? You make it sound banking. so easy. Well, it's not today. I mean, I, I, one other small digression, which you'll both be amused by, I was meeting with the CEO of one of the large banks in Canada. His daughter was a student in Chicago, and he was going to visit her that weekend, and he said one of the things he's doing is taking cash yeah. because he couldn't easily, he's the CEO of the, one of the banks. Like, couldn't you know, easily do it. Right. Correspondent <laughs> banking, it was built <laughs> decades ago. It hasn't really evolved. It's you know, based upon you know, swift messaging between correspondent banks. Uh, the, the cost of supporting that infrastructure, yeah. frankly, has gone up. One of the things that changed after the financial crisis of 2009, 2010, it used to be when, it, if the Bank of Dan and the Bank of Brad wanted to do tra cross-border transactions, we'd have what's called Nostro Vostro accounts. It used to be that when I put cash at the Bank of Dan, that counted positively towards my capital ratio. 
after that financial crisis, we decided that trusting other deposits at other banks may not be as trustworthy as we thought, and so now it doesn't count. And so banks have contracted. The, the, the correspondent banking relationships have gone by, down by 50% in the last 15 years, yet global cross-border transactions continue to grow. <coughs> so it, our view is, look, th these are technologies from decades ago. We can upgrade them with today's technology, with internet-based technologies, and make these uh, you know, real-time transactions. Yeah, and talking about upgrading these technologies, they're not even upgrading. It's just putting a more interesting, um, practical UI on top of it. I think about Venmo, how P2P existed for many, many years um, among the big banks, but they couldn't get together. Um, until Zelle, and I still remember, I think Zelle was launched during you know, an Apple, huge Apple event, so it didn't even get much press coverage, but they didn't really care because they had all the users already. How does that feel to you, you know, that worked on Venmo, it's become such a success, and I think last quarter, the amount of transactions uh, Zelle did was double, nearly double the amount that Venmo did. They can just turn on the spigots and you know, surpass the transaction volume on something with Venmo, which, you know, PayPal worked on for years and brought a lot of people into this ecosystem. Yeah. Well, I think um, P2P is a gigantic market. I don't think there's going to be any one player who's going to, uh, to, uh, to take all of that market share. It'll be spread across different segments and in different ways. And, uh, you know, um, I think Zelle's done a, a fantastic job, I think, uh, Venmo will probably do close to 100 billion uh, in volume this year. Uh, last quarter we grew Venmo, I think it was 80% year over year. Um, so um, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about uh, the growth of Venmo and I think Venmo um, for a certain demographic. Okay. Um, because if you add the PayPal P2P volume mm -hmm. in with the Venmo, it's actually the largest P2P um, Player, but if you just look at Venmo for the millennial demographic, um, it um, you know it's the way that they manage and move money right now, and it's really because it's less about a, a payment than it is about sort of a, a social experience. You know, you feed it uh, into your uh, social network, uh, you tag everything, you share everything, and so it's you know we've spent like $4 of marketing on uh, Venmo, <laughs> uh, which was a wasted $4. Um, and um, because it's just, a, it's a viral uh, it uh, is. component and, and it's growing every quarter. We have record number of net, net new actives that come on. And I think you're touching on a really important point is the audience and the market that it's addressing, exactly. right? Is the millennial and gen now generation the yeah. audience. But the growth, I won't argue with you there, has been amazing. Profits have been a different story, and it feels like PayPal has struggled somewhat. And, you know, I wonder if it's, it's not I'll about... I'll take his struggles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your, your struggles are a different story. We'll get to them in a minute. Um, oh, good. Don't worry. Something to look I've forward to. Right, exactly. <laughs> I think you already brought it up in crypto winter. Be ready. Just, All right. Uh, uh, yeah. Take a drink of water or something. Yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can help me bring up Dan's yeah, struggles yeah, if you want. Right. Um, so is it, is it about P2P payments or is it about this market of millennials and generations that, that um, the banks have a hard time accessing? Many of them, I think there's been studies saying that they would rather go to the dentist than visit their banks, right? This is sort of the PayPal opportunity to sell them more services or get them within the PayPal ecosystem. How are you doing that? Have you seen that yet? Um, well, I think... Um PayPal does have a, a strong brand. Um, now that we're working closely with banks, we can bring sort of the best of both worlds to consumers, depending on what uh, that particular segment uh, desires. Um, I do think from a, a Venmo perspective, I mean, I've been very, very careful. I think Venmo is an incredibly precious asset uh, for PayPal. Um, I think there's a, a certain magic associated with that. and. Um, you know, people talked a lot about when are you going to monetize mm -hmm. Venmo. That to me, monetizing Venmo uh, is all about uh, adding incremental services and value. So for instance, you know, we recently opened up the PayPal merchant base here in the US to Venmo users so that they can purchase at a PayPal merchant. And by the way, that gives them more value, right? So they can use Venmo in more places than just 
P2P, they can now use it to purchase. And merchants pay us just like they do uh, for PayPal. Does a Venmo user go, oh, I just did a monetizable activity? Um, <laughs> no. What they're thinking is, wow, Venmo's providing more value. Mm -hmm. You know, we provided a, a debit card so that, uh, and allowed them to uh, take money from their Venmo account and deposit it into their bank account uh, instantly, working with uh, Visa and MasterCard and others to go and do that. That was value add, and, and uh, we charged for that. So I think, um, you know, we saw just exiting last year from zero, the beginning of the year, practically zero, to the end of the year, over a $200 million run rate of revenues on Venmo, and um, you know, we're, we're pretty pleased with our progress there. And I'm gonna be careful, Deidre, I'm not. Okay. I've got, I'm gonna make sure that uh, Venmo maintains its magic. When I think about Venmo, I think about how sort of Square started with the dongle to bring small and medium-sized businesses into their ecosystem and started selling them loans. And now they have Square Capital and this whole ecosystem. They have a restaurant system. They have a Square Cash Card. Could you do a similar thing with the market for Venmo? Could you start offering loans to you know, st student loans or the whole scope of things? By using that data, there's been a lot of talk about data, and I think you're collecting some very valuable with the data with the market that you address with Venmo. Yep. Well, I think part of the secret to PayPal's resurgence is that we have done, um, um, done that. We have expanded, and you know, the way that our strategy was four or five years ago is that we need to go beyond being just a, a button on a website, but really to be an underlying platform that helps merchants to power digital commerce, the uh, advent of, uh, of mobile commerce that's blurring sort of the distinction between online and offline. And today we offer a tremendous number of services and products to merchants and to consumers that go well beyond just checkout. Um, data and information help power uh, some of that. We're probably one of the top five lenders of uh, working capital to small businesses now. Uh, as Tim and Ajay were discussing on the stage, you know, we don't ever look at a FICO score when we decide to uh, extend uh, that credit. We look at their uh, history uh, with us and then opt to uh, make that loan or not. The interesting thing is when we do loan um, working capital to a small business, on average, their sales go up 22% after that loan uh, versus control group, which is one to 2%. So by extending that working capital, and, and all of us in this room do this, I think we actually are really helping communities, neighborhoods, you know, because small businesses are the engine that drives those, and you know, I'm, I'm proud of our part in that. But I think um, we think of ourselves today as a platform, uh, not a product uh, company, and, uh, and that's, a large part of our growth is based on that uh, definition and, and that extension. Okay. Brad, let me turn the spotlight on you. Um, <laughs> you said you wished you had some of these problems, and there's a lot going on in your space right now. What do you see as the biggest challenge? What keeps you up at night? Well, I'll touch on because you mentioned it. You know, people talk about, is this the crypto winter? Uh, you know, I don't know if it's spring, summer, winter, autumn, you know, when Ripple thinks about what we're doing, uh, you know, we've had more momentum in terms of customer sales. I think we signed about three production contracts. And again, these aren't experiments. These are production contracts per week in Q1. Uh, it was a record Q1 for us. 2018 was a huge year for us. So, you know, I, I look at uh, where we are with blockchain, and I think the hype got ahead of the reality in terms of just people talking about, you know, provenance and even identity, which was discussed up here on the stage earlier, I think is a really hard blockchain problem that no one company is gonna be able to tackle. But I think that that focus has put us in a position of you know, lots of customer momentum. Uh, and you know, I'm super excited about 2019. I do think there's gonna be more M&A. Uh, I think anytime you go through this kind of, well, crypto winter trough, you see people kind of get flushed out and you've seen layoffs in the crypto space. I, I view that as a healthy part of a nascent market growing. And, uh, but you know, I think it'll force you know, real utility and solving a real problem. 
Right. When do you think that, um, sorry, you can I, I yeah. ask a question, Brett? Do you think that the different blockchains are going to come together when you say that there's mergers? Do you think the Bitcoin blockchain and Ethereum and that are going to start to? No, I was thinking more about the, there are a lot of companies that have started. Yeah. I, although I think what his question kind of the, the underlies is, you know, there's something like 2,000 different tokens and uh, yeah. by definition underlying blockchains. Mm -hmm. I think 99% of them go away. Yeah. I think most of them, you know, 99% is kind of a random number, but you know, if we ended up with 10. It's a big number. Yeah, and most of, by for, the vast, vast, vast majority are gonna go away. And I think it's because a lot of them were created with either an unclear use case or a use case that hasn't proven out. And you know, you, you already see that to some degree because there's no liquidity. Uh, and you know, ultimately in the digital asset space, you know, li liquidity is critical to the, the, the success and so, you know, we have been fortunate to build our technologies on something called the XRP ledger, yeah. and uh, you know that's done well. Is yeah. the aim still for it to be sort of a store of value so that people can spend Ripple one day? Is that going to happen? Because even at the XRP, height, right? Not Ripple. It's, You'd spell it XRP. It's okay. I, I mean, one of the areas where I think Dan and I actually agree is, you know, people talk about these things as uh, currencies, and in some ways they're currencies, but. You know, I don't expect to go into Starbucks anytime soon and use XRP or Bitcoin to buy my coffee. Uh, you know, the, the dollar works pretty well, my Visa card works pretty well, my PayPal account works pretty well. I do think in some markets, and I would point to a market like Argentina or even Venezuela, where the you know, consumers, citizens of those countries don't necessarily want to hold the local fiat. And you may see inroads uh, in markets like that where these things as currencies start to spread. But, you know, when we think about what Ripple's doing, we're using these underlying technologies to grease an engine that, ne that needs a lot, uh, can greatly improve based upon speed and cost, how value's moving around the world. But you know, for us, that's an infrastructure layer, not a Starbucks layer. Right, so when you say not anytime soon, is that ever gonna happen? Is that, you know, what you hope to I mean, see? Ever's a long time, but uh, I, I don't think in the next, 20 years, the dollar, I mean, in effect, people are saying, you know, the question says, is the US dollar going to be replaced by Bitcoin, Ether, or XRP? I just don't believe it. I, I think other currencies around the world, that's, you know, dependent upon those markets. And in some ways, those, so there are governments who've already lost control of their fiat, but that's a different, that's not the first world okay. dynamic. One last topic I wanna to touch on while we have a few minutes, and this has been discussed here, um, is the divide of what the way that tech companies are operating in China versus what they're doing here. And Dan, when you made that decision, I think it was in 2006, to partner yep. with the Visas and the MasterCards and the banks, did you, you were giving up something, you were giving away a piece of that transaction. Do you look at what Alipay is doing now and think we could have done that, we could be so much more profitable right now? Um, or do you think that they're just gonna stay as sort of, Ajay and Tim spoke about staying in their corner in China, mm -hmm. which is a very big one. How do you think about what they're doing and in terms of disrupting this huge process that has, you know, 100 players? Well, I just came back from China yesterday. Um, so, uh, you know, I had a Did you use cash? <laughs> What's that? Did you use cash? Um, no, I didn't use anything, um, basically. <laughs> <laughs> came in and out. Um, but I've used uh, WeChat Pay and Ali uh, and um, have spent time with their respective CEOs and uh, know the system well. Um, so first of all, I would make that same decision that we made over again, in complete hindsight, again and again. I think a lot of people want to extrapolate the Chinese experience to other markets, but you have to remember, like, it, they came from a completely different place. First of all, they did not have an embedded point of sale uh, system in place. So very few of the merchants accepted uh, credit cards. They didn't have really a, a, a large credit uh, system in place. And so QR codes came naturally. They, you know, and by the way, Ali and WeChat Pay battle for those merchants. They, like, don't assume that they're profitable on that because they are battling for market share uh, inside uh, that inside China uh, right now. And so uh, every country, this is the fascinating thing about payments, is different. Right? Germany, Japan, very different thoughts about credit than we have here in the US. China came from a you know, leapfrog. You look at Africa, and it's a little like telephony. 
you know, they didn't go from no phones to wireline to wireless. They just slept right to wireless. Same thing's happening in digital payment. You look at Kenya and others, you know, I forget, something like 40% of the GDP is moved through uh, M-Pesa. So um, every country is different. And, you know, as when we look at the world, we don't look at a cookie cutter approach at all. We look at country by country, you know, what is the right value proposition uh, to put out into that marketplace. And so um, uh, I think um, the Chinese market uh, is probably the most developed market in the world around digital payments, to your point. Doesn't matter where you go, you really don't use cash. Like you go into a, a lot of the stores like things like shopping carts, like they don't even know what that is because <laughs> they're just scanning and having it delivered. Yeah. You know, there's no checkout, there's uh, things like that. So it's a very different environment, but they have density in their cities and it's- I was thinking about uh, Andrew yeah. saying that he didn't know how to tip, right? Because he had no cash, but in yeah. China, right? They all just pull out their phone and give you their QR codes. And by the way, that's exiting. a simple and easy thing for us to do in this country too. <laughs> QR codes is a really easy thing to do for tipping for very small businesses, mm -hmm. but we have an entrenched point of sales system here. It's gonna be very different in the US than China. Brad, any last thoughts from you as we wrap it up? Well, I, I, I if, to the extent I would comment on the earlier panel, I think there's, there was a comment a little bit like, well, Alipay is just embedding in New York City taxis as a, you know, addressing the, the tourists. Alipay has grand ambitions in the United States. Really? I, I, I agree 100% with Dan that, you know, each market has its unique do they admit that? I'm not sure they admit that, but you think that that's, I, I, they, uh, they eventually want to be a big player in payments I here. I think there's no doubt about that. What makes you say that? I, uh, I'm sure you know, Dan and I both have had conversations with people at both those companies, and I think you know, this is a large economy. They want growth. They, they think about, I mean, Alipay in particular has been incredibly strategic about you know, making investments and then stitching together. You know, they're the largest shareholder in Paytm. They're the largest shareholder in... Uh, I can't remember the payment network in Indonesia. And you know, they're, they're, in some ways, they're building their own version of an interoperable payment right. network, but close to their, their world. Yeah. Well, it's a great point to end on. Thank you both. Help me in thanking Thank you. Dan Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.